All right. Well, welcome guys and, and ladies. Well, one lady so far. I think we should have more. We better have more. But um, welcome, welcome everyone. I would like to introduce Alan and Bill, who are with me today here on video. Um, Alan Hirsch, Bill Kochenauer. And we wanted to talk about our core values, um, kind of going through some of the core values of Creo and what we're about as a network, as a decentralized network. And um, multiplying everything is a, is a big value for us. It's really one of the things that we, one of the first things that we talk about is multiply everything. And when we say that, we say multiply everything healthy out of the harvest, disciples, expressions of the church, networks, um, all that good stuff. So I, I reached out to Bill and Alan, who are just great friends of mine, and I consider friends, mentors, uh, men who have spoke into my life quite a bit and challenged me. And uh, we've also just had a lot of fun together. So I asked them. Very, very, they, very, <laughs> very difficult work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks for your patience. <laughs> and a lot of fun, actually, to be honest. <laughs> it has been, for sure. Um, so I'm going to start off just with... Uh, Basically, one one of the first thoughts that I had was, we we read that the gates of hell won't prevail against the church, but most church leaders that I talk to seem to be in this survival mode, afraid of losing people, afraid that um, COVID might take them out. And so, when we talk about multiplication instead of this survival kind of mi mindset. And Creo, we say that that our one of our core values is multiplying everything. How do we put multiplication in the DNA um, of our movement, or is it already there? And I'm I'm just gonna drop that question and open that up to Alan or Bill, whoever wants to jump in first on that. Alan, I'll let you go first. I was I was gonna let you go first, but and then I'll, and then I'll correct as necessary. <laughs> Well, uh, you know, so, uh, Mike, I can't answer for Creo. I know that, I mean, I know you guys, I've known, you know, from your inception, um, uh, and I, I certainly think it's part of your DNA. As to whether, you know, the practice of it is there, um, you, only you can answer that, because I, I wouldn't know, you know, in terms of the metrics. But uh, I certainly think the idea of dropping it in up front um, is absolutely critical, you know. If it, it, you know, if you begin with the end in mind, and if you want to be a multiplication movement, you better have multiplication uh, as a kind of a, a DNA principle uh, deep within the culture, because it's a very different way of organising, and it requires a different way of thinking about the church um, that's fundamentally at odds with often the way we tend to think about church. Uh, so, um, I would say, you know, it's absolutely critical. Uh, it's one of the critical things for movements. Um, is, is, is getting to scalability and thinking scalability in terms of organization. Um, and it's not, a, it's, not necess, it's not necessarily a hard thing, but it, because, uh, you know, we're so stuck in our ways as a church, uh, it, it, it just runs counter to the, the, the prevailing mindset and uh, approach and methodology, yeah, which is additional. Yeah, go, go that's a, correct me. That's what the difficult is that the, you know, we tend to focus uh, when the focus is on addition accumulation and then it's longevity as opposed to impact. Um, it's a totally different uh, approach to think in terms of multiplying and in giving away and in, you know, preserving the mission, not, in, not preserving a particular form of, of ecclesiology. And, um, you know, it, it is an interesting time, um, so I, I, you know, I don't know how much you know. You all know about my background. It's sort of my day job is with exponential. So I get to talk to a lot of churches around the country, a lot of denominational and network leaders, and and you know this whole um, focus of the church. There, there, there's certainly some that are you know doing their best to hang on until things come back to what they think is going to be the old normal. Which you know we don't know how different it'll be, but it won't be the old normal. Um, and there are some that were 
you know, already decentralized, already thinking, you know, and moving this way. They're, those are the ones that seem to be thriving. But there are a whole bunch that honestly didn't know how Sunday centric they were, that, that had no idea, that really thought they were missional. You know, if, you, if you, you'd have talked to them before, before March, you know, they said they were missional and they're, they're really coming to grips with how much of their identity, their income, their effort was going into uh, simply the weekend gathering. And they're looking at, you know, how do we, how do we move? And, and if you look at the, you know, the last few decades, the mega church was really a, an iteration of the broadcast church. Um, multi-site was an iteration coming out of the, the mega church. Um, and, but moving to a decentralized um, movement of, of missionaries is an entirely different operating system. It, 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 it's not an iteration. Yeah, I love the begin with the end in mind. And one of the first things that we say with our micro churches is if we do our job, you're all going to leave and you're all going to start something new. And that has to be in the DNA right from the beginning. But let me ask you this. What, um, what would you see as some of the biggest blockers to multiplying? Uh well, you know, for me, uh, um, Mike, I'm, I'm pretty much, you know, I, I tend to think of blockers, um, now just, just, just so that people understand, this is actually a very useful way of actually taking a look at your system. Um, the, um, like your human body or most living systems are naturally geared towards health and growth. I mean, if you feed your body well, you do enough exercise like Bill, climb mountains, uh, you know, you will be healthy. And things will thrive, uh, and then you know. So, so, so the main idea in systems thinking is that you um, you don't have to push accelerators in your system. Your your system's naturally geared towards health. What you do is you take out that which inhibits health, uh, which are we would call blockers or killers in terms of movements. What are the things we're doing that's hindering the natural capacity that Jesus has built into the church for movement? The gates of hell will not prevail against us. It implies a movement, by the way, uh, because we're meant to be moving. The gates of hell don't hold, hold up against us. So, um, uh, so, so, so you swing around to thinking not so much about how can I accelerate movement. You actually look to the system that can I take out the, that which hindering uh, the the movement capacities in God's people. And I. I you know, as you know, I'm pretty stuck around, you know, the whole idea of the MDNA. If I, if I swing around MDNA, which is part of my book, uh, in the, the Forgotten Ways, uh, you can use any one of these as, as, uh, as kind of um, health indicators, but you can also look at it as blockers. So, for instance, uh, uh, if you have a Christology, which is Jesus Lord is in the center, but if you believe in Jesus as my savior, but not as my Lord, well, you're not going anywhere. <laughs> You've just got the church of the carry God. Now, Jesus is my heart. I'm saved. It's not part of the social contract. I don't have to do nothing. Well, you're not going to do much after that. So that's a theological blocker, is that we don't have the theology of the kingdom. Uh, but if you look at discipleship, uh, I would say the biggest, uh, probably the very, other than a, a, a bad sense of who Jesus is, but probably the biggest blocker of all time uh, for movement is, is non-discipleship. Uh, non-discipleship, the in, inability to make disciples will undermine everything else you seek to do. Uh, because just if you don't disciple, you've got consumers. So um, consumers won't go anywhere. They're only concerned about their own interests uh, and, and, and as much as you can fulfill it. So the problem is the more you cultivate consumerist uh, experiences of the church, the more it undermines you. And most churches don't know how to do discipleship. They have no clarity. And, and so on and so forth. APES would be another one. Uh, so if, if you, you know, movement blockers, just mess around with the APES typology, uh, uh, which is your ministry mix. Um, if you don't have generative and operative forms of ministry, you're not going anywhere either. So these, it's, it's a way of looking into your system from a different angle. Yeah, you know, you think of the, what you were saying, Alan, of Jesus is Lord versus Jesus is Savior. And, and I, would, I would argue that every church does disciple making. It's just, what are you... It, you know, what are you, what kind of disciples are you making? And, yeah. and the challenge is, I, I was just on a call last hour with a young guy that came through our learning communities. He's in a position now to, to really 
uh, make some changes in his church. And, and the, the thing that told him he's fighting against is that to a large extent, the U.S. church has discipled people into thinking a good Christ follower is attending three out of four Sundays, giving 2% of your income, volunteer when you're asked in a mission project once a year. And, and as you push into this, as you push into helping people understand, no, you, you've actually been created to be on mission by God, to, for God. To, to, to Ephesians 2.10, he's gifted you, you, you uniquely, and he's, he's given you certain passions to live into that. And, and we're really become fully alive when we live into that. What we fight against, though, is if, if I've been taught that, you know, again, three out of four Sundays, 2% of my income, all those I'm asked, and a mission project once a year, I get to be God of the whole rest of my life. That's kind of attractive, you know? And so as, as, if you're transitioning from people that have come, that have been discipled through the prevailing model of the church into a consumer mindset, that's kind of what, that's the tension that I'll feel. My experience is people that have no church background at all, and, and you talk to them about, you know, living on mission for God. I mean, it makes all the sense in the world. You know, it's just if you've been discipled a certain way. And so, so you know, what do you, you are discipling. So what are you discipling people into? Yeah, it's one of my favorite quotes of yours, Alan, is, um, or I think you quoted someone else when you said it's impossible to teach people what they think they already know. Right. Yeah. Epictetius, the, the Greek philosopher. Um, the other one is, uh, uh, Upton Sinclair, that it, it's impossible to get a, a man, person to understand a person to understand something when their salary depends on them not understanding it. <laughs> it's another mm-hmm. version of the same thing. I just use those quotes and say that's from the Australian philosopher. Alan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes. well, I mean, it's a great if if we're if we're multiplying disciples and expressions of the church, it it would make sense to start with what is a disciple. And when you ask churches, what is a disciple? Oftentimes you get blank stares. They don't even know what, how they would define a disciple or even how they would define what the church is. You're saying let's multiply, but they, they don't even know what a disciple is. And then when you, when you start to hammer that down, then you say, how many of you have made one of these? And most of their people have never even yeah. made a, a disciple. So how do we ever get to movement if we can't define what a disciple is or what the church is? Yeah. The irony is, you know, uh, Mike, is that, you know, uh, you know, we, we, in the last 40 years, the, the, we use the phrase that we're a great commission church. I mean, the great commissions are like a big, you know, thing. And uh, what they mean by that is that we, we evangelize, uh, which I love to when people do that, you know, oh, right, okay, well, you know, well, let's read the Great Commission together. You tell me where evangelism fits in that. You know, go into all the world and make disciples of the nations, right? Uh, teaching them to what? Obey. Not just to give their hearts to Jesus, but to obey. Uh, all that I've commanded you. Yes, you can baptize them into the, you know, into the family. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a disciple-making commission. It's not an evangelistic commission. And evangelism is locked into discipleship, not the other way around. And the problem is, if you begin with the end in mind, go back to that principle. If you don't factor discipleship in right up front in the social contract, it's very hard to fit it in later. So, hey, 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 it's, you know, I didn't read the fine print on that. You can't bait and switch people. You know, that's what a lot of, pe- a lot of churches are built on, on a consumerist uh, kind of uh, promise, you know, uh, just come and attend to what, what uh, Bill was saying there. Uh, the thing is, it's very hard to switch that out to say, hey, I didn't buy in on that, that nonsense about kind of going anywhere. I didn't, you didn't tell me that. And that's mm-hmm. the problem is that we sell people short to what Jesus demands of people. But as we, we don't have a, but no, I do bro. think there are, are, are a number of people that uh, maybe even can't articulate it, but there's something bubbling up inside them. You know, there's something, you know, that there's, there's, you know, there's something not right. We, we had a, one of our micro churches came out of a, a mega church and, and that, that was them. I mean, they really, two of, two of the guys were elders in the church. One actually had to resign when they stepped away before they ever found any, out anything about the underground. They just knew that it wasn't an authentic expression of the church and that they were being called to mission in a way that was being actually thwarted by the church. And so I do think, I do think there's something that, we, you know, we've been born with that, you know, it's covered over with years and years of, 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 you know, what it means to, you know, what we, we think it means to be a disciple. But I think there are, 
um, as you begin to release that and people will live into that. And, and a big piece, and this is purely my opinion, but a big piece I think is, is mission. You know, people having defined mission, there's something about um, sensing a call, even if it's for a period of time, sensing a call to a neighborhood, to a people group, to, you know, whatever it might be. Um, I mean, that becomes a crucible for disciples making. Um, it, it seems to be, when I was looking at a lot of small group ministries, you know, when, when Alan, when I, you know, first met you probably, I don't know, 12, 13 years ago, however long it's been, and you begin to press into this and you're like, well, some of these churches have amazing small group ministries in terms of percentage of people that, att that are part of it. But it was mission that was missing, you know, the, the mission might have been, you know, once a month they go down and feed the homeless, but they weren't, they didn't feel called to a, to a people. And there's something that, that's incredibly shaping about that. Yeah, that's, I mean, the core idea behind missional church is that your mission determines, it becomes your organizing principle, it determines so much about you. Uh, and, and Bill, you're absolutely right, right? I mean, like the people are born with a sense of, I mean, if you, you took the word mission out of the equation and put the word purpose there, it's really a similar like same word. You know, we, 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 we do need purpose in our lives to have a, a broader impact. I think human beings are social creatures. And we, we, you know, in, at our best, we really do want to make a difference in the world, you know, in our parenting, but also in the very things we're doing. It's not just pure self-motive, but yeah, we, we, but that requires, that does require that we, we name that and have ways to develop that, which I think, again, the church, strangely enough, after 2,000 years, still doesn't know how to do. It's, it's very, very weird. We have to worry about that. Yeah. I think so many people are just bored that, that attend church services, and that's it. They're just bored. And it, it's because they don't have a bigger picture of the all-encompassing mission of God in the world that they're invited into. So let, let me ask, um, it, as far as uh, m when people do sort of sense this, we want to multiply, we don't, we don't just want to gather people and build this big thing, but we want to go out, multiply disciples, expressions of the church, see movement happen. What are, what are some of the biggest mistakes that you see people making when they attempt multiplication? That's you, Bill. Go. Off you go. We, yeah. How much time do we have? Um, you, it has to be a primary. I mean, it, there has to be an incredible mindset shift. And I mean, if you're talking about the prevailing model of the church, you, some of what I've said, talk about it in a positive sense. So some of what I've seen in, you know, in, in exponential, we talk about five levels level one being subtraction, level two plateaued, level three being the addition, what we typically championed, level four is reproducing, level five multiplying. Pastors that I've talked to that have been successful in the level three model, addition model, that have moved to, to level four, one of the things that I see happen, all, probably universally, is that they've moved from seeing their city through the lens of their church. Here's what we can do. And, and, and I've got this church I've got to run to being broken for their city. And, and they're like, we, we're never going to get this done ourselves. How do we work? How do we work with others? And now they've begun to open up. And, and the sacredness of, of just holding on to what you've had is, is, is no longer there. The, the, yeah, having the best show in town is no longer the, the number one thing. That, that, you know, and so that, without that happening, um, man, it, it, it's hard to, to make that shift. But if you, if you try to hold on um to the past i mean you almost have to i mean and there are some places i mean there's not one um solution for everyone but you know in some places it might be um you know i've talked about people i don't know if, I don't know if i got this from you or from someone else but um part, you know you think about partitioning your hard drive and you know running you know android on one and ios on the other you know and you know for some churches that might be the answer is beginning to move in that direction, who are the people that you are sensing, you know, the, 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 um, the apostolically gifted people, the, the people that, that seem to be impatient with what's going on, you know, can you feed into them and, and begin to, uh, to, to leverage what's, what's going on in their lives? 
So you think, um, it, you know, when you say city, it, part of it's a paradigm shift of thinking about the church as a local 501c3 nonprofit entity that pays a person a salary and they run programs out of, but instead of, uh, instead we think of the church as a movement. You know, the church in so-and-so's house, the church in this uh, a collection of churches or micro churches, house churches, missional communities, uh, uh, the church in the city, the church in the nation, the church universal. And that's a big part of the paradigm shift, right? Exactly. Yeah, yeah and it goes into the way that, uh, you know, the, the Bible uses the word ecclesia, you know, at least in four dimensions. As far as I can determine, the one is the local, the, you know, as, as small as a, a house church. And then there's the ecclesia in the city. So there's that, the citywide, which I think would incorporate other um, organizations. You know, we need to see ourselves as God's people in the city. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a, that's a, again another identity shift. But then there's the region, you know, your area or your geography. And then, of course, there's the theological identity of the people of God. And but we have tended to organize uh, in the church mostly around the most local. So we have a, a notion of the ecclesia in the local, but we don't have a translocal sense. And that I think is, um, is problematic because that's where movements exist. They exist in the translocal. So we don't have a way of thinking about the church as translocal and we don't have a way of organizing and we don't have leadership that's able to do translocal, which is a huge problem, which I'm sure we're going to cover somewhere along the way, but that we need to. But another thing I would say to address the question you were saying there, Mark, um, um, just in terms of like, you know, some of the mistakes we make, I think is, um, I think one of the mistakes is this specialization of function, um, you know, where you become reliant on external organizations or a separate department. When you split ministry up into departments, it's not, you can't reproduce that. It requires an institution. So what you want to do is have a, and this is another thing, you have to have a minimal ecclesiology. You can't reproduce mega church in every, and it doesn't, it's just not reproducible. So that's part of the problem is that we have an, an understanding of the church that's not reproducible by, by the average person. And I mean by average person, the average disciple. So we need to have a, a notion of the church that the average disciple can pull, or pull off. And that, that's, a, again, another, another way of thinking about things that we need to shift. But also this idea of specialization, you know, your theological education requires that people go to a separate organization for, you know, up to seven years of study, um, or at least four years, you know. That's a huge problem, you know, in, in, in our understanding of ministry, uh, which is given when you're baptized, you know, when, you, um, when you're commissioned, you know, at your conversion, you have to then go work for it. You have to go and get a degree before you can minister. It's a huge mistake. Now, you know, I believe in education, but to say you need four or four or seven years of study to become an average, you know, in the most mainline denominations, it's seven years before you can get ordained. Really? How does that make sense of the Bible? Uh, you know, really? <laughs> so, I mean, that's a huge mistake and we, we bought into very deeply. You know? So anyway, it's amazing. I love I love the minimal ecclesiology point. Bill, you and I have talked about that quite a bit. That's something you're a part of Tampa Underground. That's something yeah. that they talk about a lot too. You guys, uh, you want to speak into that? Yeah, we. Uh, you know, when I sometimes I get call from denominational network leader and said, "Hey, we did a, we planted a micro church." And as I talked to him a little bit further, it, it's not really a micro church. It's a launch large project that just didn't have to be as big because it was a bivocational pastor, and you know, which is great. You know that I'm certainly not against that but it's it's in when you begin when i know somebody's pressing into micro expressions they run into this idea of first of all of control versus release you know because if, you, if you're going to be decentralized you've, you've got to be comfortable with releasing control and trusting the holy spirit and then the minimum ecclesiology issue comes into play because now as people have lived into their calling they started there's they're obeying a missional impulse now they've got gatherings going on and all of a sudden you're going, Hey, that, that kind of looks like a church. Is that, is that, <laughs> so now you're wrestling with the minimum ecclesiology or I had one guy say once, you know, minimum ecclesiology sounds like what's the least we can get away with. He, he likes the term core essence of the church, but so, you know, even thinking in terms of core essence, but boiled down to it, you know, 
to the bare essence. What, what is it in your context? I think understanding, and, and I think it's a healthy discussion to have. I mean, I've seen, you know, denominational leaders have that, you know, have that, seriously have that discussion and come back and go, you know, we've got some churches we call churches that aren't really churches. They've got a building and they've got a 501c3, but according to this minimum ecclesiology. So at the underground, ours is really simple. It's just worship, community, and mission. And worship is not worship music. Worship is uh, simply how, how you're honoring God with how you live your life, with, with this idea of living as Jesus is Lord. Um, community, living, you know, living in community with people and, you know, in the sense that we've come to know it. And, uh, and mission, you know, live, you know having, having defined missions. Um, not every, you know, microchurch might be a group of missionaries that have different different missions as well, but oftentimes they're, you know, they have a singular focus, but, you know, for our context, you know, worship community and mission has, is kind of where we're at. Um, Larry Wachemeyer did, um, did a study in the Bible, just the, you know, what applies to minimum ecclesiology. And I think it's in his um, uh, mobilization flywheel ebook that he did for exponential, uh, which is a, you know, a good resource if you're looking looking through that. But, uh, but yeah, it's, it, you know, what is in your context? What's the core essence of the church? You've boiled and, it down. Yeah. And the, the irony is, is if you, if you start saying things like worship community mission, Bill, I, I think I shared with you that ours is centered on Jesus, sent by Jesus and living as a family. Right. Yeah, so exactly. if you start, <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you start saying those, those things yeah. that you, you, it, some of the other churches that I've talked to have said, well, I don't know that, that we all together have centered our entire life around Jesus like that. I don't know that our church has really done that. And we're definitely not on mission. And we, we definitely haven't become like a family. We're too big. We have a show the, the people don't really know each other. Even our small groups are once a week meetings. Right. And so you, you end up going, well, even these bigger churches that don't have minimal ecclesiology wouldn't meet our minimal ecclesiology, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's bigger doesn't necessarily mean greater. It, right. Maybe they're inferior expressions of the church because they're not actually meeting what we would call minimal ecclesiology. So, Mike, I've always played around with this idea, <clears throat> and this is useful in, in this time of COVID, by the way, but if most uh, church leaders were able to time travel and let's time travel them back to say year 200 and, uh, and you say, based on your understanding of church now, what you think is church, and this is usually that kind of the building centered kind of understanding. Right? Um, and you know, the marks of how we see church now and they say, okay, go and go, and go back there to the year 250 or 200, whatever we said, and then go and see what God's doing. You know, go and, Give us a report, right? And what they're going to come back and say, oh, the church doesn't exist. Um, it's not there because it doesn't meet the metrics. In other words, we don't know what we're looking at. We wouldn't understand that as being church because it wouldn't fit our metrics or our markers. Uh, but if you ask the question, what was God doing in year 200 in, in the, early, the early church? He was doing a lot, quite remarkable, actually. Um, but, uh, you know, we, we don't know what we're looking at. I recently heard a, a Ghanaian pastor in England, who was a, was a big Ghanaian community there. And, uh, and he was saying, oh, everyone's lamenting that the church is closed in COVID. You know, we, we can't gather. The church is closed. It was, and, you know, and uh, he says, well, you know, maybe the church hasn't closed. Actually, it's opened up in a thousand other places. Uh, and I, I think that's, that's it. Can we, can we name that as legitimate expressions of Ecclesia? Are we able to take a look at it and say, oh, yeah, actually, that, that looks, at least in potential, these are actually a thousand churches in people's homes. That's a different way of seeing it. And that's a movemental understanding. But the thing is now, you know, to bolster that vision, you've got to do some work. But you've got to first see it, um, you know, to be able to, 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 to develop it. And I think that's one of the things that I think COVID is forcing us to, to, to see now is actually, oh, these are actually legitimate forms of the church that, that the average person can do. Now, we again, I say we have to bolster this because otherwise it goes messy. And the thing is, we don't have the DNA. And I know, you, you know, it's a DNA, right? So you have to get your DNA right. But 
nonetheless, it's a wonderful moment of revelation to us. Um, yeah, one of the one of the common questions that I hear as we talk about decentralizing and multiplication and seeing things go out is uh, you know, how do we how do we make sure that people stay on track, that it's good, that it's a solid movement. And I always go back to the low control, high accountability and the importance of coaching. So could the two of you speak a little bit to low control, high accountability and, and coaching? We'll build coaching now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, go ahead, Alan. No, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, I mean, it's the difference between uh, And I think Pookie's got a lot to say on this. So, but, uh, but, uh, but I think, um, uh, you know, this is a difference how maybe we organize as an institution and, you know, um, versus how we might organize as a movement. Institution tends to have high control, uh, you know, of, uh, of behavior uh, and high conformity, but it has, you know, it has very little accountability. So it's just you expect it to follow kind of a routinized principle that's built into the organization. And so movements have to swing that around. You do need accountability, you know, but, but you don't want control. So you want to be able to kind of release people to the work. Um, so again, I would say you have to have a good DNA base. You have to have core principles that everyone understands. Uh, uh, and that, you know, they, they've been discipled in this, you know, so it's built into the kind of, into the very system. And, um, and then you can release control. You don't have to control. Actually, God, Jesus is Lord, and He's quite able to lead His church if we'll just let Him. You know, it doesn't need control freaks, like clergy, you know, to, to to do it. I mean, otherwise, you wouldn't explain the early church again. So, yeah. So I think, um, and and you know, I think your yeah, coaching is is clearly part of the discipleship processes which you, we need to establish this kind of culture. But yeah, Alan, uh, yeah. Alan, when I, would you write? Oh, I'm I'm sorry. Go ahead, Bill. Uh, uh, I was just going to mention that um, when I uh, first came to the underground six years ago, we didn't even have coaches because they were afraid of, you know, the, the coaches imposing their will over the Holy Spirit on a, on a particular microchurch. And so, you know, if you think about the underground, actually, you know, on one side, you have the underground network that are the departments and department heads and, you know, there's a board of directors. On the other side, you have microchurches that are totally independent, that willingly affiliate with the underground. So even, you know, Lucas Pulley is the executive director of the Tampa Underground. If he goes into, say, Matt Lance's microchurch, he doesn't go in over Matt Lance. He goes in under Matt Lance as Matt as the elder of that microchurch. And so, so the churches are really held together both through a love of the, of, of the manifesto um, and through leadership covenant. And then they, uh, the microchurches then willingly submit to um, a a body of governing elders that, you know, if, so if there are issues that come up, then they say, we'll, we'll abide by what the governing elders say. So it's, it, you know, we're, it's probably the least amount of control that I've seen in, in any expression. And again, like Alan said, just trusting God to preserve his church. But there is a vehicle through the governing elders. If there's, you know, um, a complaint or some doctrine or something like that, that we, we need to get involved in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, how how do you keep, or how would someone who's attempting to see multiplication happen, um, how do they keep a micro church or a missional community or a house church multiplying and not becoming stuck stuck together? I mean, it seems like a lot of people who desire multiplication see these communities form. People have really solid relationships, spend a lot of time together go on vacations together, serve together, and then they don't want to leave each other. So how, um, what are some words that you would give in terms of how do you keep people from getting stuck together and not multiplying? Alan, do you want to? Well, I think, I think it, it's something to do with the culture um, and the commitments one makes right up front, the social contracts uh, at the heart of the church. Um, all living systems uh, uh, grow by multiplication. Uh, it's just built into your body, started as a single cell. It's now 32 trillion cells hanging out. Um, 
So multiplication ought to be very much part of the expectation up front. That eventually, you know, we all expect, and I, I would say like the, the, the Chinese underground church, one of them says that every believer is a church planter, every church is a church planting church. So when you come to the Lord, it's expected that, you know, you'll be told that one day you'll plant a church. I say, well, yes, you will. It will be your honor. Yes. Oh, okay. This is part of the deal. And I think, uh, you know, once you, right at the beginning, we say, well, one day you will have a church. Now, it doesn't mean that they have to have Sunday services and a whole big kind of rigmarole. It's, it's what Bill's talking about. It's what the underground does. It's a micro church. Again, I'm not, we, by the way, here, uh, I'm not, knocking and saying God doesn't use larger expressions. Um, but movements rely very much more on um, having both a kind of an organization that's able to organize translocally and, and legitimize the work uh, and also empower it. But also it definitely needs the multiplication. So I'm not trying to undermine that. I'm just simply saying that we just need, we need more both and, uh, you know, the institution provides stability, but if too much stability, you die. You know? So, um, yeah, so that's, uh, I think you've got to have the DNA and it's got to be part of the culture. Um, and uh, the other thing is that we're finding, and, you know, uh, this has been uh, well documented now um, around social dynamics. Uh, we'd say like, uh, Mike, and you know this well, is the party size rather than the small group size. You know, uh, you, you, I think, uh, the small group implies the social contract is you're going to grow deep and get to know each other and there's no expectation that this would multiply you meant to go deep but we're finding it around 40 uh, you know you, you know you big enough you're small enough to care but big enough to dare and by the way when you're multiplying you're not going across the world you're just going across the street or you know somewhere down the next neighborhood it's not like you'll ever never see each other again especially as a movement, because you'd be organized, you know, to move, come together on occasion too. So, yeah, anyway, I'm rambling now. Bill. Yeah. I find myself um, continuing to press into calling, you know, this idea that, that we are all uniquely gifted to serve God. So being part of a micro church that might be, you know, you know, I don't know, working with the homeless or, you know, working in a particular neighborhood or whatever, but you're always pressing in the calling. And, and sometimes those micro churches can be great training grounds for, you know, so multiplication might, you know, you might have a micro church that's working with people that are aging out of the foster care system. You know, they're 18, they can no longer be taken, but they've never been given any life skills. Or, so they, they get into that. Somebody else you know, gets involved in that, but then they sense a, a, a calling on their life. It may not be the exact same thing. It may be a totally different, you know, my, uh, missional idea, a, a totally different missional impulse, but, you know, continuing to press into those. And I think also not having uh, predetermined ideas of what a microchurch is. Um, I mean, we've got a couple that's a part of, you know, what we're doing is, you know, they work with uh, helping to get uh, people out of, or, or once they, people have escaped, human trafficking, they're usually left with an arrest record for prostitution, grand larceny, whatever it might be. They can now, uh, he works as an attorney to petition the courts to get their records expunged, their fines expunged and that sort of thing. Well, there's not been a, a you know, a micro church of other attorneys that have grown around that, you know? So, so I think, we, you know, there's just all kinds of um, uh, missional impulses. In fact, I, I I'll say this one other thing. When I first came to the underground, there were four, we talk about micro churches in four stages. Stage one is there's a missional impulse. You, you, I feel like God's calling me to do this. Stage two now, some things are happening. You've got people coming around. Stage three is where you've met our minimum ecclesiology, worship community, and mission. And stage four is where you've multiplied. When I first came to the underground, I, I felt like, well, that's kind of cheating calling level one, level two churches, missional, you know, call, counting them as micro churches. You know, when they don't meet our, when we're saying they don't meet our minimum ecclesiology, I've come to realize that it's so important to honor that missional impulse that by calling it, honoring by calling it a micro church is, um, is really powerful. It's, it's empowering because the prevailing model of the church works so much against that, um, that, you know, so pressing into that. So I think, you know, certainly there are groups of people and, um, and, and the focus is always on, you know, you just, you can't focus on longevity. For longevity's sake, you know, you're focusing on the mission, and sometimes, uh, you know, microchurches morph. You know, sometimes what you've been doing needs to change, or 
you know, needs to die and go away and be rebirthed in, in some other form too. So just, it's a whole different way of thinking about ecclesiology. Bill, Alan, I've, I've talked to both of you quite a bit in the past about the importance and the need for people to listen to the Holy Spirit and to their community, to people, to their neighborhoods, to their cities, and observe, and how that's more important than planning, and this tendency with so many churches that we, that we talk to or individuals that attempt to live on mission to kind of plan things out rather than listen to the Spirit, listen to their cities, and observe what the Spirit's doing. You guys want to um, kind of speak into that at all? Because we've got a lot of people with a lot of ideas. Can we talk a little bit about listening and observing? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll say something. Um, um, yeah, I think the, uh, the listening thing is, is a very, very important missionary function. Um, and, um, you know, it, in, in fact, I, I think really the best and the, and the most potent mission starts not with the methodology. I think you need methodology. You need to train people in that. But, but, and, and to have the kind of DNA and everything right. Um, uh, but, but, but the listening skill is to, to see what God is doing and to be aware of that, that God is in the neighborhood. is uh, is there long before you as a missionary got there and he's wooing people to himself in Jesus Christ. Can we have the eyes to see and the ears to hear what he's doing and join with him? So find out what God is doing and join with him is actually critical uh, listening skill. That uh, is very, very important. Um, my, uh, my, my buddy, Michael Frost, uh, uses the phrase of, you know, dating your city. It, it's actually a really good metaphor, actually, to, you know, it's, it's good dating, you know. Um, uh, is You know, you're going to, you know, put your best face forward, you're going to be, you know, and, and by the way, just for anyone who knows this, you don't just talk about yourself <laughs> when you, when you date, because that will just kill, kill the date. You try and find out what's going on with the other person. And what, you know, so you become curious about them. And then with the idea that, you know, this is potentially a long-term relationship and hopefully marriage, you know, so, um, and marriage is covenant. So I think it's actually a very good metaphor is to date your city is to fall in love with her, you know, court her, woo her heart or her, his heart, you know. And I think um, it's, it's a, yeah, it's a good metaphor. Yeah, I, I just had, I have one more question, but I know that in a conversation like this, there, everybody's heads are spinning and thinking about questions they have. So I have one more question and then I'm going to open it up for some Q&A. My last question is um, movement and the importance of APEST. I'd, I'd love you guys to speak a little bit to if we wanna see multiplication of disciples, expressions of the church, networks. Um, well, how important is APEST to that? So I'm, I'm gonna let, Al, since Alan literally wrote the book on this and not one, but a couple, I, I, I would be, I think you ought to, why don't you take oh, it? Uh, no, because actually, APIS belongs to us all. So, Billy, I, I'd, I'd like your opinion. Well, I, I, I'm on, I am on record uh, as being uh, totally committed. And I, I think one of the assumptions of, of movement thinking is that God has given you everything you need to get the job done. It's already been given. Uh, it's in the deep, in, in the resources already given to the church, uh, in its latent capacities and potentials, latent within the body of Christ. Uh, one of the one of those factors is uh, APIS and I um, mean, it is a very important one. So if you, and again, I um, tried to study movements all my adult life, and uh, and I can say this with some some authority, I think. Um, so where there's never been a movement that went to scale, a multiplication movement, there has never been one that didn't have a best function. Uh, it does not happen. Because, you, because to be a movement, you have to have the ministry capacities, and this belongs to all of God's people, the ministry capacity to both generate and sustain. And so the generative form is the apostolic, prophetic, evangelistic. For different reasons, they generate new forms. They, they, they provide kind of impetus for learning and in, innovation for different reasons, uh, each three of them. And the other two are the ones that take what is given and make it a whole lot better and more sustainable. 
So the shepherd and teacher take what is given. They don't generate new forms, but they make what is given a whole lot better and healthy. And you need all fivefold forms to be it. And, and just to be clear on this, um, and I, I love asking a group of people, so like if, if apostolic stands for the missionary function, the, you know, the entrepreneurial, the uh, experimental, the, uh, the pioneering front line kind of function, um, Prophetic is alignment to God's purposes and maintaining our integrity, uh, both culturally but theologically, staying aligned to God, very much about God orientation. Evangelist is your recruiting capacities, your capacity to, to sing the song and to get people to buy into the organization. Uh, shepherding is to take and, and to create flourishing communities and teaching is to become, you know, uh, to integrate truth uh, meaningfully into life, you know, to become wise people. And which ones don't you want in your local church? Uh, and why the heck don't you want them? And who, who gave you the right to choose anyway? These were given to you in the ascension by Jesus as his functions. Uh, in the very founding of the church, you don't get to cherry pick. You're not allowed to. And if you cherry pick them, you, you, you know, you will end up, you know, with flaws in your design. And I think we have inherited a form of church that has cherry-picked the shepherd and teacher and they've exiled the apostolic prophetic to some degree the evangelistic. And it's disastrous. It, you cannot be a healthy movement without all five. Uh, no one dominates anyone else. It's a, it's, a, it's a ministry in the way of Jesus. Only Jesus is the head. But these are deep functions for the church that we need to have in order to be healthy. And God has already given them to us. So we'd be thankful for that. Yeah, and I, th I think yeah. Ephesians 4 introduces a new way to think about e even leadership in general. And, and, and I was serious about you know, those of you that aren't familiar with Alan's writings. He's written a couple of books on APES that, that if Alan weren't here and you asked me, you know, for recommendations, those would be the, those would be the books that I remember, uh, that I would recommend, 5Q being the most recent one. But, um, you know, you, you think about, leadership and and you know it's it's it seems to be and again I, i'm not one to say what god can use and what he can't use um i know four people that have been in ministry for over 20 years that came to faith on acid you know so i'm not recommending that as an evangelistic tool but you know god's going to use what god's going to use but you know ephesians 4 and thinking through apes seems to be suggesting a different way of leadership than you know, the typical CEO model. And, and again, I'm not saying the CEO model is dead or even wrong, but, but what does it look like to bring all five of those voices to bear on what's happening in your church? Yeah. An interesting thing, Mike, if I may add to that, is that, you know, um, you think, well, does a micro church have a best? And the answer is yes, it does actually, at least in potential. Uh, it's DNA. So your own body and mind has got DNA in every cell. Uh, the full coding of your, your brain is in your toe. I mean, what the heck is it doing there? Uh, you know, and so the full coding of the capacities for APIS is in the smallest cell of the church. Uh, if you take a group of 20, 25 people, I guarantee you've got APIS there. It might not be well developed. In, in fact, that, it probably isn't because the church doesn't know how to name it, let alone develop it. But but it's already there late in, in, in capacity in all of God's people. So, and in fact, it's in each one of us. Each one of us has an APIS capacity. Um, all five are there. You might suck at the last one you know, on your list, but you, you can do it. Um, I guarantee you can. So it's not that far away. It's right there. And the trick is to name it and then have pathways of developing this. And, but naming it is very, very important. And, uh, and understanding these things. And so, yeah, take the journey on this. This is almost a silver bullet. It almost, it changes everything because it touches every aspect of ministry. Every dimension is impacted. So early on in our, in our chat, I got a little private chat from Aaron Loy asking if he could ask a question. And I said, wait, no, it's a little no, Q&A no. Q time. So you, you can be our first. You all now have the power to unmute yourselves, by the way. So wait for Aaron, and then uh, you're free to ask some questions. Hey, Bill and Alan, good to see you guys. See you, Aaron. Likewise, brother. Yeah, so I've got a question. You know, um, I know for those of us who are wired more apostolically, 
Um, some of this is maybe a bit more intuitive. You know, like when I got turned on to APAST, it felt like, like you were giving me language for something I somehow knew already, but couldn't articulate or really know how to live into just yet. But also knowing, you know, I know not everybody <laughs> all is a part of the, the EFCA, but the EFCA is certainly a shepherd teacher, teacher shepherd culture, which I know is true of many churches. So for those of us who are teacher shepherds, what does it look like, you know, operating within our gifting, those who are in whatever leadership capacity, what does it look like for them to use their wiring, their gifting to lead in multiplication or to create a culture and environment where that can happen? I'll do a quick answer, but I think Bill would have something good to say about that. Um, but I, I think that it's, it's about just making space for other types of ministry to, to, to come into the room. Uh, for the shepherd, I would say, you know, be a good shepherd. And, and, and by the way, in, you know, a shepherd looking after sheep, if you stay with the metaphor, well, you want your sheep to multiply, don't you? I mean, there's an, in, even the shepherd wants lots more sheep, you know, the whole point of farming, I guess, uh, is, is to have more. And, and your sheep are capable of multiplying. They, you know, they're organic. <laughs> so I just think don't get in the way of what God wants to do. Uh, and then I, I think just be a good shepherd and bring people in, you know, include people. That's a good shepherd. Don't try and control people's behaviors to such a degree that you exclude the diversity that's necessary for a healthy kind of functioning system. Uh, have the unity, but bring the diversity in. For the teacher, I think it's about time as a teacher that you begin to correct this fatal flaw that, you know, and, and begin to speak, use the language of APIS. Bring understanding to us. Uh, don't lock it out because you're threatened by it. Uh, it's caused incredible damage in the church. So I would say use, your, use who you are to actually allow others within the body of Christ to enter into the game. Um, because they, the answer really is in the other. So diversity is critically important for a healthy dynamic system. Bill? Yeah, I think um, uh, I mentioned that I think Ephesians 4 suggests a new way of, of leadership. And part of that is whatever you are in APES, you tend to think that's the thing. That's the thing we need. And so it takes humility. You know, so if you're a shepherd, you're like, we, we, we must take care of these people. And that's, that's a primary, we have to have the humility to be able to welcome in the other voices. And, and particularly with a shepherd to, to recognize the apostolically gifted people and to em empower them and empower them to do things that, that maybe you're even uncomfortable with doing initially. You know, if you're a teacher, we've got to get it right. We've got, that's an important function, but you have to have the humility to, to, um, to bring in the other the other voices to be able to speak into what you're doing yeah bill i used to um remember feeling like a terrible christian <laughs> because my wife would talk about these these people in our community that needed certain individual needs met and i'm thinking i have never had a thought like that in my life <laughs> But yet I'm sitting here talking about, um, you know, how we need to form a new community and multiply and do the, and she's never had that thought. And I, I just find it really interesting how, uh, how much better we all are together and as a, as a community when everyone's expressing those gifts, because it looks more like Jesus than any of us do separate from each other. And then the problem is, again, if you don't have the nuance and diversity, then what is it? All the leadership function falls on you. So if you're the pastor, you might not be a good pastor at all. I don't think I was a particularly good pastor. Can I minister? Yes, but not pastorally, not terribly. Well, I can do it, you know, but it just wasn't my thing. That's what I think you're saying there, Mike. Uh, I can, I can do then, it, but I, I can yeah. do it, but then I need like a beer or a nap, Alan, one of the two. <laughs> yeah. The beer after every one, you know, it gets a bit problematic. But but the thing is that the thing is, then I end up doing what I'm not really made to do. My purpose, my 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 calling is not being fulfilled, and that's why you you need to see APES in terms of calling, uh, your your particular contribution to the world, uh, your mojo. It's what you add to the world, you know, um, and it's important that people find that because they're self motivated at that point. You don't need to kind of keep cajoling them. Uh, you know, because people will motivate because it's meaningful for them. 
uh, to act. So, and by the way, uh, I would say also again, get me going on this. Just it's not good, but but it's interesting how you know the language of the Bible is. is language is really really important. I would say this is a theological issue before it is a, a functional ministry issue. The thing is that when we don't have the language to name what we're seeing, is we we see it, 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 we're linguistically blinded, and and so. Um, but the words in the Bible, the words that occur in the Bible, I mean, the word apostolic, most people you ask, what, what's an apostle? It goes, uh, 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 mm. they're in the Bible, which is true, but they're also outside the Bible. Um, you know, in fact, the Bible uses secular terminology. Apostella was a functioning Hellenistic society. Uh, and they say, uh, there's 12 of them. And actually there were more. Uh, and one of them, at least what we can tell, is a woman. So it's like better. Uh, you know, in other words, and it uses the term 84 times. And just, just by way of comparison, the word shepherd uh, is used once. No kidding. It's the only time it's used as a noun uh, for the ministry of believers in the New Testament. Uno, once, in, the, in, in Ephesians 4. It makes it really important. It's, it's a foundational text. I'm just saying, but we think we know what shepherds are. I mean, we've got everyone's called a shepherd. You know, pastors, right? Everyone's a pastor. Really? How did we make sense of the Bible with that? Prophet is used 144 times. And no one knows what a prophet is. Oh, they're in the Old Testament. Really? 144 times in the New Testament. You think you shouldn't know that language? And what it, what it points you towards? And you know, how, how are you meant to understand the Bible? You claim to be biblical. Think Bible here. Bible words matter. And the repetition of words shows the mindset of the, of the writers of the scriptures. If they use a word for 144 times, it means something, folks. You know, you need to start thinking through those categories. Repent. Repent. We've made a huge mistake here. Go back to the, to the scriptures on this. Really important. Hey, Mike, there was a, a question earlier on, how do we get started? I put a couple of links in the chat to um, some free resources from Exponential. One's the Made for More uh, kit that uh, Rob Wegner was the co-author on, but it's it's a, a really a study that's built out of the book of Ephesians to move from a posture of recruiting volunteers to mobilizing people. Um, I think there are 15 or 16 videos that are part of that. Um, and the even the flywheel that puts it in context with people living into their calling. And then Brian Sanders from the underground also wrote a book called Network Church that's a, a free download as well that might be good resources if, you know, I don't know the context of everybody on the call, but if you're in a situation where you're, you're wanting to make a shift, those might be good places to start. Yeah, that's really great. Appreciate that. Um, why don't we just take one final question and I have some that were sent in the chat already. Uh, yeah, we have the starting from scratch. How do we stop accountability um, becoming de facto control? We'll end with that question. I'll give that to Bill. I've been dominating yeah, I mean, the last few. Yeah, I mean, we're pretty, um, you know, we're, we're pretty low on, on control, you know, and, and we, you know, we've had, I mean, I think what's unique about the Tampa underground is that you've had a group of people that were, you know, really committed to, you know, what became known as the manifesto. I mean, that's, you know, your heart beats faster when you read it. And then, you know, being serious about signing a leadership covenant. And then we really rely on that a lot. And, and as governing elder, you know, as a governing elder in the St. Pete underground, I don't, I don't um, insert myself anywhere. Now, if an issue comes up, you know, then the governing elders will, you know, will get together and pray about it and work with it and, you know, and, and deal with it as we need to. So, um, yeah, there's just, you know, accountability in the traditional way of thinking about it there, you know, we, we really don't have that because if, if you don't, if you're not really sold out to mission, if you're not really sold out to this, you don't want to be a part, you know, so you kind of self-select out, you know, you're, you're, you know, if you don't, 
you know, if you're not really sold out, um, it, you're, you're probably not a part of it. And so, you know, I guess, I don't know, maybe just because that it started that way 12 years ago, it's, you know. I had someone say to me, Bill, um, I, you guys are like the special agents of Christianity. Like, I just want to sit down and listen to someone and be encouraged. That's it. <laughs> and so they opted out. But that, that is what they do. They opt out. It does yeah. happen a lot. Yeah. The only thing I would add to what Bill is saying there, Mike, is that it's remember that accountability is a relational term. Yeah. Um, and so, it, it, you know, there's an investment of relationship there, which is called discipleship. And discipleship is a mutual honoring. You know, there's something deep in, in the relationship. There's love, there's commitment, there's service. And, you know, when you love someone, you will be able to hold them accountable. They will, you know, there'll be a healthy, without having to pull rule books out and all that stuff, there will be a natural way of speaking into people's lives if you invest in it. But the, the question is then goes back to discipleship or non-discipleship. If they're really disciples, you know, they'll understand it. And I think that's how movements hold together on lots of mutual accountability and love. Yeah. yeah but one other thing that I would say too is I'm really uncomfortable when someone calls me and says, hey, we studied Francis Chan's model and Selma's model. We want to study the underground's model. I'm, I'm really uncomfortable with the word model. Um, no one has this figured out in the sense that it, there are prescriptive steps and anybody that says they do, I would run very quickly away. Um, and that's part of what's difficult is that we have a prevailing model of the church that's very prescriptive. You know, there are certain steps to, um, and moving in this direction is, um, you know, I mean, certainly, you know, check out different places that are, you know, different things that are going on, but um, it is, it's much more stepping into de descriptive territory than prescriptive territory. And so if, if you're looking for, you know, seven steps, you know, to a microchurch movement, I, you know, I don't, I just don't, I just don't think it's, we're to the point where it's that prescriptive. It goes back to the listening and observing piece, right? Yeah. Thinking like a beginner again, and what does church look like for these people? And yeah, for sure. And also, I would say I, I, I underscore this because I think movements have to have DNA. They are, you know, and it needs to be articulated. If you prefer the idea of foundational principles, cornerstone concepts uh, that really are important and are spoken about, and then accountability can be held around those things. So, but you don't want too many, you know, but they're, they're minimalist and should be empowering to all. But you hold accountable on core, you know, with you, you, Bill, it's the manifesto for you guys, right? Mm -hmm. That manifesto holds you together. But it mean, having a manifesto is a, a theological identity document. You know? So mm -hmm. it's very important to have that. So work at that. But m minimalize it and put it in heart language, and not just in the language of the mind to motivate yeah. people. Guys, let's thank, let's thank Bill and Alan for joining us. It's good to have you guys. And <laughs> Fun to this, be with up, you. this upcoming week, we'll, uh, I, I think we can continue the conversation around multiplying everything and coaching calls and talk through some of your challenges and what you're trying to do. So we can continue to discuss it together in, in groups. But thanks for coming. I'm going to stay on and catch up with Bill and Alan for just a couple of minutes. So be with you. Thanks, guys.